world news tonight. Burning up. California races against time battling severe waves of wildfires. Communal outrage. Indians rally in the capital against rape and murder. Glistening glory. The Olympic Games nears its end in a final showdown between nations. Building dreams. British engineers pull a Tony Stark move, making dreams a reality. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with an open invitation from the United States. U.S. President Joe Biden issued a memo that would offer a safe haven to Hong Kong residents in the United States for up to 18 months, which is believed to be in response to Chinese oppression in the region. Hong Kong native and Notre Dame research associate Maggie Sham told Reuters on Thursday she cried tears of joy upon hearing the news that Hong Kong residents living in the U.S. would be given a temporary safe haven. Her reaction came after U.S. President Joe Biden offered a safe haven for up to 18 months to Hong Kong residents in the U.S. The White House move comes in response to Beijing's crackdown on democracy in the Chinese territory. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Obviously our hope and our objective and our work on the international uh, forum is to change the behavior uh, that is happening and the oppression that we're seeing of the people in Hong Kong. But certainly uh, this step is one that um, is meant to ensure we are uh, practicing what we preach in terms of human rights values and ensuring that uh, people who are in this country uh, don't face the ongoing repression that we're seeing in Hong Kong. It's the latest in a series of actions Biden has taken to address what his administration says is the erosion of the rule of law in the former British colony, which returned to Beijing's control in 1997. Last year, China implemented a new law in Hong Kong to criminalize what it considers subversion, secessionism, terrorism or collusion with foreign forces. The White House said in a statement that the U.S. will not stand idly by as the People's Republic of China breaks its promises to Hong Kong and to the international community. Some U.S. lawmakers want the administration to do more. Republican Senator Ben Sass called the safe haven move a solid step, but said the U.S. government needs to go further and offer full asylum to Hong Kong residents in the U.S. A historic town in Northern California has largely burned to the ground, conceived by a massive wildfire. While not far away, another wildfire's wrath left another town that stood since the gold rush in burnt ruins. A towering plume of smoke and flames visible from space as a fast-moving wildfire burned homes and forced thousands to evacuate in Northern California. The so-called River Fire scorched at least 1,400 acres in two heavily wooded counties northeast of Sacramento. And according to fire officials, a thousand acres burned within the first two hours of the fire starting on Wednesday. Some residents said they evacuated their homes even before the official warning came, because the blaze was spreading so quickly. Making matters worse, the river fire was less than 100 miles from the Dixie Fire. That wildfire has consumed 278,000 acres and was only 35 percent contained three weeks after it started. But officials were hoping some cooler weather and a reversal of the wind direction would help efforts in containing the river fire. California is grappling with the state's worst drought since 1977. And with more than a dozen wildfires burning, California is on pace for even more burnt acreage this year than last year, which was the worst fire season on record. Europe is currently facing the worst of global warming with unusually warmer summer temperatures which sparked heat waves, fires and intensive heat all over the continent ranging from Finland to Portugal. For more on this we have other than a world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani? Yes, Shenali. EU scientists said that this July has been the third hottest on record, behind only 2019 and 2016 with unusually high temperatures seen in regions from Finland to the Portugal. 
Multiple areas were hit with extreme weather events last month in line with scientists' concerns that global warming is making heat waves more likely and more severe and that a hotter planet will lead to a heavier rainfall. The region's heat wave comes on the heels of devastating wildfires last week in Spain, Greece and the Italian island of Sardinia and less than a month after catastrophic flooding in northern Europe claimed more than 200 lives. Experts say freak weather events like the floods in Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands as well as the recent heat wave and wildfires across Canada and the US are a sign of the impacts of climate change. Droughts are becoming more frequent and more severe in the southern Europe and environmental authorities have warned that the region is at the greatest risk from the impacts of climate change on the continent. While Belgium and Germany experience deadly floods caused by extreme rainfall, some regions including Germany and parts of Russia were slightly colder than average. These changes in the weather are a result of changes in the planet's climate due to the greenhouse effect caused due to extreme release of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. We have some good news for you. Countries around the world are working to achieve carbon neutrality. South Korea is no exception, as President Moon vowed to achieve the goal as early as 2050. It's an ambitious plan for the next 30 years. South Korea emitted more than 727 million tons of greenhouse gases in 2018, making it the fifth largest emitter among the OECD member countries. To make that close to zero tons by 2050, on Thursday, the Presidential Committee on Carbon Neutrality unveiled the first draft of three policy blueprints, each covering different proposals for reaching this goal. Under the first scenario, greenhouse gas emissions are to be reduced by 96.3 percent compared to the level in 2018. Also, it aims to make full use of already existing coal-fired power plants while pursuing an energy transition using key technologies. This scenario calls for the proportion of electric and hydrogen cars in the country to reach 76 percent. The second scenario aims to eliminate 97.3 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. All coal-fired power stations will be closed, but liquefied natural gas development will continue. Also, people's daily energy consumption will be significantly altered. Under Scenario 3, net greenhouse gas emissions will be reduced by 100 percent. There will be a complete suspension of coal and LNG development, and these will be replaced by green hydrogen technology. Also, the proportion of electric and hydrogen cars supplied among all vehicles in the country will be 97 percent. However, the plan has been criticized by many who say Korea's economy is built around manufacturing and so reducing carbon emissions so drastically would lower its competitive edge. The government will come up with the final plan in October after collecting public opinion and feedback from the business and labor communities. Enraged protesters gathered in India's capital outside a crematorium where a nine-year-old girl was allegedly raped and murdered by a Hindu priest who denied any wrongdoing. The alleged rape and murder of a nine-year-old girl in India has sparked days of protests which have been growing in momentum. On Thursday, demonstrators gathered outside the crematorium in New Delhi where the incident is said to have taken place last Sunday. Police allege that the girl was killed after she went to fetch water from there. Her family said they weren't looking for the girl when she failed to return home. They claim they saw some of the alleged perpetrators, who worked at the crematorium, incinerating her body against the family's wishes. Police said four men have been arrested on charges of rape, murder and criminal intimidation. They were not available for comment, could not determine if they had lawyers. The incident has drawn into focus the rampant sexual violence in India, with some calling for the perpetrators to be hanged. According to the latest government data, there were more than 32,000 rapes recorded in the country in 2019, almost for an hour. There were more than 100,000 kidnappings of women over the same period, 
a third of them with the aim of forcing them into marriage. The chief minister of India's capital has ordered a judge-led inquiry into the nine-year-old's case. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. New Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi takes the oath before parliament with the country facing an economy battered by U.S. sanctions, a grinding health crisis and thorny negotiations on the 2015 nuclear deal. Elected in June polls marked by record abstention, Ibrahim Raisi succeeded Hassan Rouhani as Iran's new president. It was his second attempt at the job after coming in second in the 2017 elections with 38 percent of votes. The conservative cleric who ran on an anti-poverty and anti-corruption platform previously held several positions in Iran's justice system. He was attorney general from 2014 to 2016 and in 2019 he was named head of the country's judiciary by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, a sign of the trust placed in him by Iran's supreme leader. A hardliner, Raisi belongs to the ultra-conservative camp that distrusts the West and is under U.S. sanctions for his alleged involvement in the 1988 execution of thousands of political prisoners. While Raisi has hinted he was willing to restore a landmark 2015 nuclear deal, he's made it clear he sees it as Washington's responsibility to revive the agreement. My serious suggestion to the U.S. is for them to swiftly fulfill their obligations. They must lift all sanctions to show that they're truthful. They must know that our foreign policy does not start with the nuclear deal and will not be limited to it either. Raisi will now be under pressure to jumpstart an Iranian economy severely impacted by U.S. sanctions and mismanagement without upsetting his conservative backers. As we approach the last week of this year's Olympic Games in Tokyo, things have so far seemed very different from other Olympic Games over the course of Olympic history. Moving along with today's updates, China overcame host Japan in straight matches to claim its fourth consecutive title in the women's table tennis team competition. The U.S. team won the first Olympic gold medal in the women's beach volleyball since 2012 when they beat their Australian rivals. Tokyo 2020 organizers reported 29 new COVID-19 cases linked to the Olympics today, bringing the total number of recorded infections from the Games to 387. They were identified as contractors, Games-related personnel, volunteers and one member of the media. There have been 33 total cases reported from the village as of today. Now let's take a look at the leaderboard of the Olympic Arena over in Tokyo. At first place we have the People's Republic of China, followed by the United States of America at second place. In third place we have host nation of this year's Olympic Games Japan following closely along its Great Britain at fourth place. Next it's this year's controversial Russian Olympic Committee at fifth place. And at the last of the big six we have Australia at the sixth place. Despite WHO warnings on jabbing a third shot due to a global vaccine shortage, the U.S. has decided to administer a third jab to at-risk Americans. In a race against the highly transmissible Delta variant, the United States is working to give additional COVID-19 booster shots for at-risk Americans with compromised immune systems. Top U.S. infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, immunocompromised individuals are are vulnerable. It is extremely important for us to move to get those individuals their boosters. And we are now working on that and will make that be implemented as quickly as possible. With that goal in mind, the U.S. is joining Germany, France and Israel's plan to give boosters to certain individuals and ignoring Wednesday's plea by the World Health Organization to hold off on boosters until more people in poorer nations can get their first shot. We need an urgent reversal. According to the WHO, low-income countries have only been able to administer 1.5 doses for every 100 people due to lack of supplies. Vaccination rates are much higher in wealthy countries. Even so, the United States is grappling with rising COVID cases, which are up about 43 percent over the previous week. 
The spread of the Delta variant is much to blame, especially among the unvaccinated. But breakthrough infections among the fully vaccinated are also occurring, though they are far less common. The ultimate end game of all this is vaccination. According to Fauci, the U.S. needs to vaccinate more, not less, and this is not the time to pause. To further up their vaccination rates, the EU sealed a deal with the U.S. vaccine manufacturer Novavax. For more on this, we have Adhidhar World News Special Correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna, who reports to us now from Normandy in France. Chetan. Yes, Shanali. The European Commission has approved a supply contract with U.S. firm Novavax for the purchase of up to 200 million COVID-19 vaccines. Under the contract, EU states will be able to purchase up to 100 million doses of the Novavax vaccine with an option for 100 million additional doses until 2023, once a shot has been approved by the EU drugs regulator. This deal would allow EU states to receive the first Novavax doses from the last quarter of this year. Novavax confirmed the deal in a statement and said it was working to complete the submission of vaccine data to the EU drugs regulator in the third quarter of this year with delivery of initial doses expected to begin the following approval. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Chetan Adharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. The Delta variant of the COVID-19 virus is spreading quickly across the world, especially in regions with low vaccination rates. This comes as global infections surpass 200 million this week. The Delta variant of COVID-19 has now been found in most countries in the world, 135 countries to be exact, according to the WHO. With that, the WHO chief Dr. Tedros has called for a stop to booster shots to allow poorer countries to get their first doses. The goal, he said, is to vaccinate at least 10 percent of the population of every country. Officially, at least 2.6 percent of the world has been infected with the virus, but the true figure is likely higher due to limited testing in many places. Many parts of the world are seeing a surge in cases driven by the Delta variant. And that's true even in countries with successful vaccination campaigns or those that have, until now, had the virus pretty much under control. The U.S. has hit a six-month high for new daily cases, surpassing 100,000 infections on Wednesday. Florida, in particular, is seeing worrying numbers of hospitalizations, now above 10,000. China is also fighting off the Delta variant, which has spread to more than half of its provinces, ordering mass testing and sealing off at least one city. Indonesia has become the second country in Asia with a death toll of more than 100,000. Iran has hit a record number of new daily cases with nearly 40,000 infections in a day, a concerning figure with only 3 percent of the population vaccinated. Israel, boasting one of the world's highest vaccinated populations, has reinstated its virus curves as daily infections hover around 4,000. Meanwhile, Sydney, Australia had its highest number of new infections yet on Thursday at 262 while state of Victoria is to enter a snap one-week lockdown. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Israeli jets struck rocket launch sites in Lebanon early in response to two rockets fired towards Israel from Lebanese territory in an escalation of cross-border hostilities amid heightened tensions with Iran. France's High Court upheld a new law requiring the public to hold a health pass to access bars and restaurants and health workers to be vaccinated against COVID-19 by mid-September, saying it compiled with the Republic's founding charter. Hundreds of Cubans expressed their solidarity with Cuban government during the anniversary of the Malikanazo, a 1994 uprising linked to dissidents that saw more than 35,000 flee to the United States. France has stepped up coastal patrols, but migrants are still crossing the perilous channel of to Britain. Just a day before, French police had picked up life vests scattered on the beach together with the remains of a dinghy. Officials in Nigeria, a hub for illegal wildlife trafficking, have seized a record amount of pangolin scales and claws and elephant tusks as the government attempts to combat the trade. And 
finally tonight. Have you ever dreamt of flying yourself around the sky like Robert Downey Jr.'s Marvel character Iron Man? Well, that dream has now become a reality as a British scientist has made a new flying suit. A British man has revealed his newest invention for fans of solo man flight. Richard Browning, the jet suit's creator and founder of a company called Gravity Industries, said he switched from jet fuel to an electric-powered suit. Browning said the electric suit has enough power to run a small street of houses. It might be a lot less romantic than what you've imagined, but it's still in the testing stage. And in fact, the company's previous fuel-powered suit was able to fly at nearly 130 kilometers per hour. In recent months, the military and emergency services have been testing out the suits in the hope of using them for rescue operations. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.